Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Honorable distinguished speaker, participants, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. I'm Henny Handayani as your MC for today. We are all grateful here to be blessed with help and the opportunity. As on behalf of our committee, I would like to extend warm welcome and express our gratitude for your presence today. Center for Educational Assessment, in collaboration with Indonesia Educational Evaluation Association, HAPI, and Indonesian International Islamic University, UEEE, proudly present, secondly, the second public lecture by David Andrich, Emeritus Professor, Graduate School for Education and Senior Honorary Research Fellow, Medical School at the University of Western Australia. The public lecture titled The Polytomus Ras Model for Social Measurement, which is held today, December 6, 2023. This event is conducted virtually Zoom meeting from different places across Indonesia and also from international participants. Welcome and thank you for joining us. This public lecture is also live streamed on Pusmendik's YouTube channel. Proceeding to the opening ceremony, we would like here to request everyone here to please listen the national anthem of Republic of Indonesia. Indonesia Raya.
thank you for this official opening we would like to request the honor ibu asrianti phd head of center for educational assessment to deliver the opening remark ibu yanti your microphone is yours thank you bu heni assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests and fellow learners, good morning. It is pleasure to meet you again and to host the second public lecture by Professor Andre. In the first lecture, I believe some of you attended, was held at the end of October with the topic The RAS Model and Its Paradigm. In the first lecture, Professor Andre made the distinction between a measurement model and a statistical model which leads to the notion of the RAS paradigm. Based on this paradigm, the function of the model is not to explain the data. Instead, it is used as reference to provide a better measurement. In explaining the, the RAS model and its paradigm in that lecture, Professor Hendrik applied dichotomous data. As we know, in social measurement, we deal not only with dichotomous data like right or wrong, zero or one, but also polytomous data. For example, in cognitive tests, we are familiar with score of zero, one, two, or one, two, three, four. Or in non-cognitive instrument like questionnaire, rating scale, we find option. For example, strongly disagree, agree, strongly agree, and etc. As we know, Professor Hendrik has been working on the RAS model more than 50 years. In fact, especially polytomous data, he has published a rating formulation for respond order categories in 1978. I think at the time I, I'm, I was in a primary school. We extend our sincere appreciation to Professor Hendrik for sharing his wealth knowledge with us and I'm personally grateful that he's willing to give a second lecture on this topic. I believe this topic, polytomous model, will be illuminating and intellectually stimulating. Thank you, David. I would like also thank to Pak Barul Hayat, Pak Bambang Subintono, all Pusmendik teams for all the support in making this event possible. This lecture is a collaboration between Center for Educational Assessment, Pusmendik, Indonesian Educational Evaluation Association, HAPI, and Indonesian International Islamic University. We thank all participants for being part of this learning journey. I hope the takeaway from this lecture will strengthen our commitment to provide a better measurement. All the best. Selamat pagi. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Ibu Asrianti, for the opening remark. Ladies Thanks. and gentlemen, it is time for us for the highlight of our event today, insightful lecture by Professor David Endrich that will be moderated by Bapak Bambang Sumintono. Here is a brief of CV of him. Dr. Bambang Sumintono obtained a PhD in Educational Policy from New Zealand Agency in 2007. He wrote two textbooks about the application of RAS modeling for social sciences research in Bahasa Indonesia. Dr. Sumintono is also an editorial board member of the Educational Assessment, Evaluation, and Accountability Journal and Pacific Rim's Objective Measurement Societies. Without further ado, the microphone is yours, Bapak Bambang Sumintono. Okay, thank you very much, Guheni. All right, so good morning all. Okay, uh, we are very <clears throat> happy to have this second uh, public lecture with uh, for David Enrique. Okay, so I think all the audience already know about the Prof. David Enrique. So uh, David Enrique is Australian. Dr. David Enrique got the PhD from uh, PENSA program, University of Chicago, right? So uh, just come across to uh, one article. Uh, the title is about Centometric Review of Rush Measurement, 
So it's written by uh, three researchers from uh, National Institute of Education, uh, NTU Singapore. And they explain that uh, one of the uh, uniqueness of RAS model, uh, it can apply in any discipline that has uh, human measurement content of it. Okay, One of the crucial factors that RAS can be used in any discipline is because the introduction of a uh, rating scale model that invented and developed by Professor David Enrich, right? So we are very grateful today, this morning, to have him to give the second lectures. Okay, so we would like to hear more from him and then have a great time uh, with these lectures. Okay, from David Enrich, the screen is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, uh, it's exactly 50 years that I did complete my PhD and uh, it's uh, like 45 years that I published that 1978 paper. And I worked on that for three or four years after my PhD uh, to work out the implications of, of what Rash was saying for ordered category data. I'll share the screen and I'll be, uh, I've been studying this and working on this, as I say, for close to 50 years. And Gianti said, uh, there's so much, that can be thought about. And what I'll present are some highlights. After the lecture and with Brianti, uh, I'll, I can send some uh, papers, but I'm sure you already have some. So this is going to be about the highlights of the model and some important points of the model. Uh, and some new points for you. Maybe there'll be some new points, uh, hopefully to make it interesting uh, and uh, make some people study it uh, further and apply it more. So I'll, I'll share the screen and see if this works now. Thank you. Okay, are, are we, can you, can you see this? Is this set ready to go? Can, you, can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, this is just the cover page that you've already set. And I'll see if I can come down. Oh. This is a picture of where I am, and you're here, and that's me. Uh, we're in the middle of nowhere. This is a desert side. Uh, obviously, ocean there, ocean there, and desert north. So, uh, Yanti has spent time there. She's very familiar with Perth. And some of you that joined the Matilda Bay Club, uh, I'll just show it, which is a, uh, a website. Uh, that's the picture from my university looking back over the city. And this is the Swan River. And of course, it's called after the black swans that are native to the river. And that's the Perth background uh, there. Okay. So the polytomous model for ordered categories, uh, we can have non-equidistant, equidistant or reversed thresholds. Uh, so I'll, I'll highlight those. And uh, the re very relevant point will be the implications of the reverse thresholds and what they mean, and that's consistent with the rash paradigm uh, uh, perspective and contrast with a traditional perspective. And then we'll look at a specific case when the thresholds are equidistant, as you might find in a ruler, a regular measurement. Then we're going to think about random, what randomness means, because in many cases we just take this for granted, but here. In this lecture, I want to make it explicit. And then everyone knows the normal distribution uh, named after Gauss. And I'm going to make a connection between the rash distribution with equidistant thresholds, which is just like measurement, and the Gauss distribution. So this is that last bit is probably new for most people. And we'll see that in that case, the rash distribution, polytomous model, is a discrete form of the normal distribution. 
Okay. Now, we learned last time, and you've read, that the model is derived from that the comparison between instru uh, instruments be independent of the objects of measurement, that is, so that you can compare instruments like a centigrade and a Fahrenheit thermometer, and objects of measurement should be independent of instruments. So you get the same measurement whether you, if you transform a comparison between two temperatures independent of whether you've got one thermometer or another thermometer. So the model is derived from the algebra of this requirement. And uh, this particular form of the model appears in the 1978 paper that's been mentioned. And as I said, it took me about three years to work out uh, the full implications of this from about 1974 when George Rash visited Perth and we had discussions on, on this. He had a multidimensional form and, and, and so on. And then uh, in 77, I worked it out and published it in 78. So this is the measure of the person. What's interesting is that the coefficient here is a number x, which is simply the count of the number of thresholds the person has exceeded. Now these are, you've got m plus one categories. They're just m cut points and all thresholds. And if you've got a score of five, then you have exceeded the five thresholds. And the denominator here is just to make sure that the probabilities add up to one. So th this, this number here is just the sum of all the numerators. So for a score of zero, these thresholds disappear. You have a zero here and you've not exceeded any threshold. This threshold here doesn't actually exist. It's here to make the algebra look good and easy. If you score one, then you've exceeded this first threshold, and the number one appears here. But this x is simply the count of the number of thresholds you have passed. And this is a very important statement that we often uh, ignore. When you've estimated these parameters, and I won't go through the algebra of estimation and so on, so this is interpretation, when you have estimated the parameters and you plug this value in, so you've estimated the parameters of your, your thresholds or your cut points for the item, then for any particular person value, there's a probability that you'll get 0, 1, 2, 3, up to them. And what is this statement? It looks obvious here. We've got a hat on it because it's an estimate. Now, it's the third distribution of replications as if this person responded to an item with these parameters a thousand times. It's as if the object with this parameter was assessed independently and repeatedly with the same instrument, with the same estimates, many, many times. So it's a it's a distribution, and we have to keep this in mind for, I'll keep reminding us why this, in this lecture, I'm stressing it. It's, it's usually just taken for granted, but because it's taken for granted, sometimes and very often people do not make explicit connections with what it means. So this is an example of 10 thresholds. And, and I've got them as de dotted because they are behind the scenes. So this is an example of an item with 10 thresholds. The thresholds are not equidistant. And you imagine the dichotomous model behind each, each threshold. So probability of exceeding this threshold, that's what this curve is. 
probability of exceeding this, probability of exceeding this threshold. But of course, in a polytomous item, these are not independent. If you've exceeded this threshold, you've also exceeded every one of these before it. So, For example, if someone says you've got a temperature of 38 centigrade, that means it's more than 37 and more than 36 and more than 35. But at the same time, it is less than 39 and less than 40 and less than 41. If, you, if, you, if it wasn't less than 40, you'd be very sick. So, so if you've got a threshold, a value of here, for example, uh, five or six, that means you've exceeded six thresholds you've got to, and you have not exceeded these thresholds over here. Now, the typical picture we see is the next one. So typically we see this picture here. This is the probability of a zero. If you're down here, you've got a very high probability of a zero. If you're here, you have a high probability, highest probability of a five, but you have also got a probability of a six, seven, eight. And this is a picture of the probability distribution for different levels of the person measure different levels of beta. Now, if you've been working with the model, you're familiar with this picture. You, you might not get this line here, but I'm emphasizing this dotted line. And at this dotted line, there is that dichotomous response. If you've got a score of eight, that means it's above seven and above six and above five and so on. Okay, so this is just elaborating something that I think most of you would know. But this picture is often not produced. And uh, because I, I took me about 30 years to realize that this picture, which I have in my head, most people did not have in their head. And so this is the last feature that was put into the RUM program. This comes out from RUM now and I wish I had made it the first feature. Uh, so this is an example of the picture that I showed you, 10 non-equal distant thresholds. And this is, for example, the location of a person. That means this person has some probability of a zero, one, two, three. And now I'm going to bring up explicitly the picture that implies. So it says that if this person this location, then the probability distribution for 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 is this. So you see, this is a distribution of probabilities. So this person is, this is the inferred, that if we did this many times, this is the probability of about 0.35 for a score of 2. This is the probability of a 1, and so on. So it's not going to be certain what the response is, but this is that distribution. And for every value along here, you get a different distribution. Is that okay? So this is this picture here in relation to this picture is not typically shown in textbooks and, and so on. So this is a bit new, but it's it's the point of the lecture as something new. But I think it's fundamental as well. As I said, I wish I had taught this right from the start because some of my best psychometrician people don't seem to appreciate fully the implications of this, and that's the part of this lecture. Okay, so here we've just, I've just made it because I'm going to make a connection to regular measurement. What if the thresholds are equidistant? That's as if in, it's in a ruler the ruler thresholds are equidistant. So the difference between the RASH model for polytomous model and this one really is a typical measurement is that our thresholds are not equidistant. We haven't got as far to make the thresholds equidistant, but there are some important connections. If And what I'm making is an example where they're equidistant and the difference between successive categories just happens to be 0.8. This is just to illustrate it. If we have this, and we've got a person with a location of exactly minus 2, 
And the picture looks like this. So it's very similar to the picture we had before, but these distances are equidistant. And there's a high probability of a four, a bit of a probability of a three, lower probability of a one, sorry, uh, two seems to be the highest probability, and so on. Uh, I've done this just to repeat the, the, the this fundamental point. But there's this particular case has caused issues for people from a traditional paradigm. The What the auntie learnt when she was studying with me, and I hope she's taught people, is that if you get disordered thresholds, if you analyse your data and you get a picture like this, that this is a problem the data. It's not a problem with the model. The model estimates come out, but they reflect this problem and in fact the thresholds are not properly ordered. They're all mixed up here. And what is the implication of this? In this region, in this region, if someone happens to be here, this is the distribution. So you have equal probability of getting a 10 and 6. Now, if you, were, if you were a student and this was some sort of a grading system for uh, very poor down here and 10 up here, I don't think you would like a system where you can get a 6 and a 10 about the same probability but then you've got less chance of getting an eight or a nine. You would think that's a very strange system. Uh, and in fact, it is strange. The thresholds are reversed. It means that getting an eight might be easier than getting a seven. And that's strange in an ordered category system. But with all the statistical analysis and so on, people lose sight of this very point. This picture is seldom, if ever, drawn as the implication of this. Now that I've drawn attention to what happens with reverse thresholds, I'm going to shift to traditional statistics and, and, and ask what is a property of a random distribution? That is, you, you've characterized everything and all that's left over that you don't know is no more than random. It's uncertain and random, and it balances itself out. So now I'm going to go to some basic statistics that, again, is not typically, we don't think of, uh, we just take it for granted. But it has very important point here to make it explicit. So... The Gauss distribution of the normal distribution with a mean of 5 and a standard deviation or variance of 1.25 looks like this. Now, what you're very familiar with it, so I want you to keep in, this in mind because I'm going to ask us to say what's in common with a lot of familiar random distributions. This is a distribution of repeated measurement errors that is random. This is if you replicated many measurements, but you don't get the same value, what would be no more than a random measurement? The Gauss distribution is a theoretical distribution as to what random measurements, if they're not the same, should look like if they are random. This doesn't mean the distribution will be like that. This is a theoretical distribution of randomness. Now, you're all familiar also, you use often the chi-square distribution. This is a distribution based on the normal with a degree of freedom six that I've just drawn here. And there is something common between these two. There's a difference in shape. There's also something common. I want you to think about what might be common. Now, this is continuous, but the RASH model is discrete, so I'll shift to a discrete distribution. What about... The binomial distribution, here I've got one with a probability of 0.6 and 10 
replications. You're tossing a coin 10 times, but the coin is biased and it's had a higher probability of a heads than a tail, for example. And that's what this distribution looks like. So what's common between that distribution, that distribution, that distribution? And we'll just do one more. The, the Poisson distribution with a parameter of three it looks like this. So because of the that, I'll, I'll volunteer what's common, but I'm hoping you've worked out a contrast between those distributions and this one. So this would be a discrete non-random distribution. That's one that is. Well, we'll point it out. The problem is, for this distribution, it's not random because it's got two peaks. The probability of a big error is not always higher or lower than the probability of a large error. So this, if, if the object is here somewhere, you might have this and you might have that. And this error is smaller than these bigger errors, probability. So the difference between that and that is that this is single peak, a single mode, single peak, and this does not. And historically, we do not teach students that the characteristic of all these random distributions that we study, the chi-square, the binomial, the Poisson, the negative binomial, and so on, that they are random distributions and they're all unimodal, a single mode or a single peak. And that this is not a random distribution. Now, we would teach people that this is not a random distribution by saying, well, if you've got a bimodal distribution, you should not use the mean to characterize it. We are taught that in school, that this is not, this, that, that this distribution uh, is not the distribution we can summarize with just one number, with a mean and standard deviation. So if you had boy, heights of boys and girls, it wouldn't make sense to take the average because the average is not uh, typical of either one. So in this case, some systematic factor is affecting the distribution. It's not random. Something's pushing that a score of seven is higher than six and eight, but also four is even higher than six and, and five, and then three drops off. And this is not a random distribution. And so we might think that having a single mode makes it a, a random distribution of replications. But in fact, that's not enough either. A single peak or unimodal is necessary, but not sufficient. This is an example of a unimodal but non-random distribution because seven here is disproportionately high relative to this pattern. And this too, according to a mathematical definition of randomness, is not a random distribution. And having built this up now, I will show you what a mathematical definition of randomness is that is, again, typically not shown. It's typically not done. I've coined the term, it needs to be smoothly unimodal. That is, the unimodality needs to be smooth. Not too extreme like this. And we'll come to the algebraic definition. If you've got these probabilities, probability of a zero, one, two, three, four, up to whatever, maximum, then this ratio for the distribution to be random and for it to be smooth and unimodal, this ratio has to hold. This, the middle number, probability squared, 
divided by the product of the two alongside it for that item needs to be bigger than one. If it's bigger than one, then you will get, for every X, you will get a nice smooth distribution. This, is, I believe, is something new to the majority of people listening. It was new to me. I, I knew about it uh, very early because I discovered this for, for order thresholds, but it was much later through interactions and reading that I discovered that actually there is literature on this topic. There is a paper way back in 71, which is not that long ago, really, that points this out. In the RASH model, and this is, this is where I'm now connecting that to the RASH model, in our ordered category RASH model, this ratio is exactly e to the difference of the two successive thresholds. So this is remarkably simple. This divided by this simply a function of these two thresholds. What's important is if this threshold is bigger than that one, which means this is greater than zero, it means e to the positive number is bigger than one. And this is the the among a number of things a compelling reason to say our thresholds have to be ordered in order to believe that we've accounted for everything and that's all that's left is randomness. If we've got these ordered, then any further variation is no more than random. So a, a randomly unimodal distribution requires this property for all x between 0 and m. So you need this. And it turns out the RASH model has this property. The thresholds are properly ordered. If they're not ordered, then you can see this, this becomes less than 1. If that is less than that, difference is less than zero, and this ratio is less than one because this becomes e to some negative number, and this is less than one. And so if that is less than one, then for some x, for some x the distribution is not a random, unimodal, smooth distribution. This is an example where it's something where it's negative, where where this difference is negative, and you get this mess here. The implications of this mess, as I've shown before, is this, and this is not a random distribution. If we've got an estimate for a person, and we've got these thresholds as estimates for this item, then the implication is that this is the distribution, say, for this person. It would be similar for a person up here. Uh, all around here, we've got this sort of distribution, and you infer that if you repeated this many times, you would get, for example, 6 and a 10 equally often, and you would not get these as often, and therefore this is not, you have not summarized all the systematic factors that are going on and the distribution is not random. It would be like if you've got two examiners or number of examiner, uh, examiners examining the same paper and you've got this distribution or, the, as I said, you're rating some performance and you gave it to 100 uh, uh, assessors and they came up with this distribution. What what number would you give for this person? It's it's the systematic factors are there. Something's happening to make some of the assessors give it a ten, and some of it give it a six, most likely. And these numbers this here. Maybe that's a poor description of the categories. Maybe there's something particular with this uh, piece of work and so on. But you don't know what the problem is. But the symptom of the problem is 
that something more systematic than randomness is going on. Now, if you're working within the statistical paradigm that I was talking last time, people don't draw these pictures. They estimate the person parameter. They estimate the item parameters. And the graded response model estimates parameters. And you just make inferences about the person parameter without recognizing that you are violating one of the most simple aspects and understandings of uh, random distributions and uh, and through the various statistical al and algebraic activity you're doing, you lose sight of this very important point, the, the fundamental point. So this is what I'm trying to convince or demonstrate to you here is that if you have an item that turns up with reverse thresholds in the RASH model, that means you have to think about it. Now, sometimes it can happen just because you've got extremes and you don't have enough data and so on. But I've got examples and I can show you a paper where this happens, where the majority of the data are actually here, and you still get reversal. Then the question is why? And that means going back to asking the assessors looking at the marking key and whatever is being done. Uh, when I finish this, I can send one, uh, I can send a paper on exactly this point and that contrasts the traditional perspective and this perspective and gives an example of a data set where the majority of the responses are here and yet the last two thresholds are reversed and you can tell there's a problem. In the case of equidistant thresholds, we had a look at this before. So, well, I'll just push this bit further in the case of equidistant thresholds. You would, of course, think that it's very odd to have thresholds reversed in a measuring ruler or a thermometer or, or something like this. So I want to push this a little bit further to show the analogy between uh, that if you make the RASH model have equidistant thresholds, then it's just straight like ordinary measurement. Uh, if we have a person there, this is the pattern of responses. This would be the probabilities. You can have it there, then it's probability of zero, one. Two. I had a research assistant help me. I'm animated this. She was good at this. I'm not good at this. So we've got two cases here of people here and here with these equidistant thresholds. And in this case, the distance is just 0.8. So this is just like a ruler. And I'm pointing that attention. So when the RASH model has equidistant thresholds, it's actually just like a ruler. So the RASH Plutibus model is a relaxation of equidistant thresholds, but you can't relax that the thresholds are reversed. They still have to be ordered, even though they might not be equidistant. This is an example of one of the people. If you did repeated assessments for that person, you would get that distribution. For the other person, you would get this distribution. But both distributions have this property. Because their distance are equal, if you took this ratio for all the numbers here and you took the ratio for all the numbers here, you would get exactly the same value and you get the same value for every pair of thresholds. So it's a nice, uniform, uh, smooth distribution. So that this distribution and this distribution mathematically are uh, have the same smoothness. In the case that these extremes are zero, and I just want to, and this is a property of the normal distribution. You, you can't have the distribution uh, at ex, uh, push to extremes. The normal assumes that that you you're well targeted and that the extremes have probabilities of zero. So. In the case, in this case, we have person with a beta of zero, mean of five, 
and a variance of 1.5. In fact, the variance is exactly one over the unit. This is very elegant. This is new. It's, I've published it, but it's it's uh, some connection here between the variance and the unit. So, so the smaller the unit, the bigger the variance. There's an explicit algebraic connection there. Now, if we did the normal distribution, continuous normal distribution, with a variance of 1.25, it's the picture. Now, we put something that is discrete. It turns out that the rash distribution is right on the normal distribution. It is exactly on the normal distribution. And so when you've got equidistance between the thresholds, you've got your, your variance, you've got your probabilities at extreme close to zero, that you've got the full, nice, normal distribution, then the rash model with the same thresholds and the same variance is right on the normal distribution. Of course, if, if, if you're pushing it out here, it's also on top. But if you push so that you're hitting the boundaries, then you will see that they separate. But no one would accept that you can use the normal distribution when you've got this extreme. Anyhow, uh, the, the point is that if you have equidistant thresholds and you are well targeted, it's just like measurement literally, and you end up with a normal distribution. So the, if you follow the mathematics of the RASH model and the RASH distribution, ordered thresholds give random error distributions. If you repeated it, it would be no more than error. Or if you have more than one marker, you want the difference between the markers to be no more than error. Disordered implies some systematic factor operates, and you need to go back to study. It's not about modifying the model. The model already captures that. It's about going back and understanding what went wrong in the data collection. And equidistant thresholds give a discrete form of the normal distribution, and it's easy to make it continuous if you wanted to do the algebra. And I, it's no more, it's not a coincidence that the rash theory leads to the normal distribution if you po follow the mathematics and make the thresholds equidistant. And it really, to me, validates the rash requirement of invariant comparisons. That's it. Thank you. So I think we've got time for some questions if, if people would like it or like me to repeat any other section and so on. So uh, would you like me to stop share or maybe in case we need to use the... Yes, Rob, yep. Stop share. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Rob David Hendricks. Uh, things, uh, uh, more details about the, the secret of uh, rating scale model. Uh, that you already told to us. Okay, so uh, it is not only about uh, item difficulty. It is not only about uh, person ability, but you have to take into account another thing, which is about uh, threshold difficulty. I think uh, Prof. David Andrick already explained that uh, comprehensively, right? So many social sciences, uh, I come across that they like to have a longer rating in case that the statistical calculation have enough variation. So I always question what is real intention you have longer rating if the uh, threshold difficulty is not ideal it's because the threshold is step, as you mentioned, is not equidistant, right? So uh, now we would like to go to the next step, which is question and answer. I think, all right. So I think somebody from Pusmenik, you want to show the question?
Okay, bro. Uh, this is uh, one question, right, from Muhammad Dwi Rifki. The first one, are there any noticeable differences between linear rating scale model, which was developed by Jared Fisher, and then the original rating scale model, which was developed by you in 1978? Your answer, bro? Uh, well, uh... Uh, uh, from what I remember, that paper just elaborates the model with some more structural parameters. Underneath it, it the response of a single person to a single item is exactly the same, except the parameters could be structured arising from some different combination. And in fact, uh, I think that's not di very different from when you have uh, structure on the item parameters. But if you, for example, you could have a grader uh, parameterized. So different graders have a different harshness, and then their parameter is added to the threshold parameter if the graders are of different harshness. So you have a structure on the item parameters. But when the person is rated by a single grader, underneath it is just the response and characterized by those thresholds. So... At, at the deepest level, there is no difference. Similarly, there's no difference between what people call the partial credit model and the rating model. Mm -hmm. The partial credit model just has different item parameters for the different items. Mm -hmm. uh, but, and the rating scale model has different diff overall difficulty parameter, but the thresholds are the same across the items. But when a person responds to a partial credit item or a rating scale item that particular structure is identical it's the mm. probability of responding in this category given these parameters uh, uh i when i did the rating scale model well people call it ben wright called it the rating scale model it was a rating formulation and in fact if you look closely the partial credit idea is not relevant for this model. Now we call it the partial credit model, but doing things successively is not, that's not what this model is because the probability of getting a zero depends on where the last threshold is. It's it's mm -hmm. all dependent. So it's not like you take steps. The word step was totally wrong in this context. But uh, mm -hmm. where, uh, my... Uh, uh, so people developed the unconditional method for the dichotomous and for this. And in fact, Winsteps and uh, uses unconditional methods. The uh, uh, I think the other big program uh, that uh, Conquest uses some kind of marginal maximum likelihood, both for dichotomous and polytomous. The RUM program that I am responsible for uses conditional maximum likelihood because I think... Uh, well, that follows theoretically, and I don't know of any correction factor when you have uh, that. So uh, the only reason is people's technical skill and their determination to find a conditional method of estimation that's efficient. It's not. Okay. It's not a mathematical reason. It's. It's that they are personal and expedient reasons. So I kept worrying about finding a method for conditional estimation and the way RUM does it, it also doesn't have a problem if some categories have a zero frequency because we exploit certain features. So, so uh, uh, the, uh, there's no particular mathematical reason. It's, it's, it's uh, pe people being expedient, wanting to get a solution and so on. But good questions, very good questions. All right, okay, thank you, yes. Uh, I think that's uh, most likely is about technical thing. Which one is much better in order to uh, get the location? Uh, in order to calculate the location, for example, that kind of thing, right? So, uh, mm -hmm. okay, uh, somebody from Puspenik, you you want to show another question, or I move to the chat room here? All right. Okay. Now, Prof, uh, I got this. Oh, sorry. Okay, so uh, this is come from Mr. J. Pribadi. In your experience, are there 
are there effective strategies for determining the optimal number of response categories in the context of RAS model polytomous item analysis? How can one strike a balance between ensuring model complexity is sufficient for accurate representation and maintaining good model fit? I think this is the one that you already touched about. Is it longer wrapping better? Something like that. Okay, Prof, go ahead. Yeah, this is a very important uh, uh, question. And it's really the task of the uh, researcher in a context to work it out. But I'll give you two examples as illustrations. One example is that if you've got an attitude questionnaire and you have something called undecided, the typical Likert scale, strongly disagree, strongly agree, and you have undecided in the middle, it is almost always the case that you get reverse thresholds. And that's, you can look at it and say, that's because the undecided category is not really in the middle of the other categories because you could be undecided because you, it's irrelevant, it's not applicable, you don't know, and so on. And we had an experimental situation once where people did a rating on, on something before and after. And before, they did not know anything about what they were going to be uh, 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 responding to, a questionnaire. So it was before mm. and after. After they experienced this experimental situation, then the thresholds were reversed. They had undecided because they were no longer undecided. Now they knew. Mm -hmm. So in fact, the ordered thresholds in this situation covered a problem that mm -hmm. the people actually didn't know what they were responding to, so it was more or less random. But when... Uh, uh, so my advice, and it's been taken up where... I've shown this to people, is that if they have a uh, one of those Likert's questionnaires strongly disagree to strongly agree or something like that that's bipolar, to put qualitatively on the site not applicable as something distinct and separate. And they can see how many people respond to not applicable uh, to them. And, and if there's a lot of people, then that's a problem with the question. And then invariably those strongly disagree to strongly agree works nicely. So that's one example mm -hmm. where you you it, it's become systematic. There was another example. So, so the point is that it really depends and it's the researcher that needs to work on it. Just like in physics, the instrument is designed. No one says a centimeter should be used for everything. Sometimes you need a millimeter, sometimes a nanometer, sometimes a light year, some, and so on. The other example was we had educational assessments, and I don't know if Auntie's ever seen this when she was here. Uh, my colleagues were students, in fact, were involved in assessing, in analysing the assessment of educational testing in writing. And someone had designed nine criteria, and uh, sorry, eight criteria, and every criterion had eight categories. So that's six, potential 64 responses. But when you looked at the data closely, when my colleagues looked at it closely and they talked to me about it, it was evident that things were wrong. There, there were it was very what's called lumpy. Yeah, the distributions were, didn't make sense really. And the problem was that some of the categories, some of the criteria in the categories, they just had too many categories. People could not operate with those categories. And what they were doing is effectively saying, well, this is a good essay. So they gave it a high number to every all the criteria and a low one. So that they were not distinguishing the criteria. So my colleagues, one of them was an English teacher and she really knew this work very well. So they looked at each criterion closely, looked at the data and analysis, and they made some, some criteria. They just had two categories. Some had three, some had four. Overall, mm -hmm. when you added up, they only had something like 40 possible scores from zero to 40. The other one had eight, eight, 64, zero. But when analyzed, they had the opportunity to expert. The zero to 40 clearly showed much greater precision than the zero to 64, because now the categories were working properly. And 
and because the different categories had different, sorry, different criteria had different number of categories, they actually had to think and really make it specific rather than just using effectively a big halo. Like this is, yeah. Uh, and so some sometimes when you give eight categories and the thing only operates in two categories, then, then your response is unsystematic, it's different from different people and so on. So in both cases, it really depends on the situation, the context, and you analyse it. So I don't think I'm in a position to say in every situation it's always three categories or it's five. We did have mm -hmm. another example with early childhood where uh, uh, there's a particular index when the kids come to children come to primary to, to pre-primary kindergarten and then the big question is how many of them are and uh, which ones are more independent less independent who who can do their shoelaces and whatever whatever they had a couple of subscales that only had three categories and they had some two subscales that had five categories the five categories just didn't work it, okay. There's too many categories for the for the teacher to be able to distinguish the students on these criteria. So in that situation, with early childhood assessment, uh, it, it's it's just three categories in that particular question. So it really okay. depends on the situation, and you should research it and 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 deal with that context rather than have a universal. Uh, uh, answer to to that question, but it's a very important question. It is a tr it's always some kind of optimization. All right, okay. Thank you for your class, Prof, for the very clear answer. So I think uh, we have two question that is nearly similar. Okay, uh, the one from uh, Zali from Malaysian Myras, okay? The question is, normally for most of us, once we see this ordered average uh, measure or ordered uh, rest and threshold, okay? Here, all right, okay? And then we tend to collapse categories, okay? Any comment on this? And follow with the question from Arif, Universitas Gajah Mada. Prof. Enric, is there a problem when disordered thresholds are not addressed by collapsing categories and reported as it is? Okay, your comment, Prof., your answer? Yeah, that, that, that's very, very good. Uh, my perspective is that the collapsing categories after the fact should be seen, if possible, as a hypothesis. In fact, in theory of the model, Collapsing categories after the fact is not the same as collapsing them before you collect the data. So collapsing after is after. Is, is a good way to, to see how it can work. In fact, theoretically, and it's in the 78 paper, you should collapse the categories if the discrimination between, between two categories is zero. And the RUM program provides evidence for the discrimination at the thresholds. Uh, but after the fact, uh, co collapsing should, if possible, be seen as a hypothesis for how you might reconstruct the, the, the ordered categories. It's telling you basically you've got too many categories for some reason or other. And then the question is to go back and see which, how you can reconstruct them. My colleague and I, with this early childhood index, the, the where there were five categories, we went, looked back, and when we reconstructed new scales, sometimes we collapsed the first two, sometimes the last two, sometimes, but and renamed the categories. So, my the perspective that it's not just it, well, it is my perspective, but it's a perspective that literally follows from the theory of the model, is that collapsing after the fact should be seen as a hypothesis for how you might reconstruct the categories for further collection. And in fact, that's what they did with the uh, uh, editing of the, for, for changing the rating criteria for the essays was in combination this to see how you could reconstruct the categories. And sometimes they have to be just dichotomous, sometimes three categories, sometimes five. And you have to use your evidence 
to to reconstruct the category. Now that I know that's the ideal situation. Sometimes you're just forced to do something, and for that particular exercise, you need to collapse some categories. But look at all the combination of evidence to 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 uh, to justify it and understand what's happening where you need to collapse the category. So you should should not just collapse them routinely, automatically, without thinking. Okay, thank you, Pro. Based on my experience, uh, when I have two, uh, one data set, one without collapsing, one after collapsing, so most likely after collapsing, all the psychometric attributes become better. So that's yeah, why exactly, exactly. Uh, empirically, so I just choose uh, the collapsing is much yeah, better yeah. situation, as you mentioned, that this is a uh, good, uh, uh, what you call this, uh, data that can be reported. Okay, Prof, this one is a bit different. The question, okay, is come, uh, okay, uh, a bit different. The first one, uh, <clears throat> the question is, in the RASP model, the assumption of equal discrimination parameter across item is indeed a simplification. Uh, in, indeed, simplification it might, might not perfectly represent reality. The model assumes that all items have the same discriminatory power, which might not be in the case in practical situation where different items can be indeed have varying levels of discrimination. Do you think the 2PL more model more suitable for assessing polychotomous scales and why? Well, uh, that gets to that philosophical issue. Uh, okay. When you have a ruler, you don't have different width for the different, you don't have different discrimination between 10 centimeters and 11 centimeters and so on. So uh, the to get sufficiency, to get invariance of comparisons and all the rest of it, to get the total score to be sufficient, the discriminations at the thresholds need to be equal. So that's a requirement. Uh, the problem with the 2PL model from a statistical point of view, is that the belief about the discrimination comes from referencing it to somehow the total score or or, or uh, a summary that's within the data. If you could find some external criterion to say, hey, yes, this one references externally better than the other, then uh, more discrimination relative to some separate criterion, that would be convincing. But a, a, a theoretical or an observed is that if an item highly discriminates with respect to the total score, it's redundant. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you might as well take it out. And in fact, but what you do is you actually give it more weight because it's reference to the total score. So there's a certain irony in thinking that something is more discriminating and the evidence is from internal to the data themselves. So, so uh, I, I find that uh, uh, very odd. Be, be, in fact, you can construct a set of items. Well, I had a student who did a master's thesis where she made a lot of items sort of like response more dependent on each other. Well, then they discriminated more. And if you and, and actually relative to our simulation, uh, they were providing less information because they were redundant. So it's a very odd argument that this is highly discriminating when it's referenced to the total score and all the other items. It's true that it's capturing what the other items capture, but sometimes you could just argue just as much that it's 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 locally dependent, it's response dependence, and that and that you're weighting it more, even though it's 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 more dependent on the others. If you were to take one item, maybe that's the one item you should take. But if you've got all the others, you can throw that item out because all the other items capture what that item has. So uh, it's it's a it's a kind of a statistical issue, a philosophical issue, and in my opinion, it's getting carried away, if that's the expression, with the statistics and forgetting some fundamental points. <laughs> 
apply to the point prop. Okay, I'm agree with you. So, uh, how come that uh, people telling that in Russia you have a very similar difficulty level? Is this not out of, it is out of context? That's why we use uh, RAS in order to identify the location or the threshold. It will be different based on the empirical data. Right, Rob, uh, next question is come from Poppy. Okay, uh, The question is, what should we do if there are incomplete answers? Like many of the testing cannot finish the question because of time. And if it is possible to explain what expect would happen if RAS with this incomplete answer. Okay, well, it, it, it kind of follows. One of the properties of most programs now and our program, RUM program, is that incomplete data in itself is not doesn't stop the estimation. Uh, in mm -hmm. Australia, we have something called NAPLAN, which is the testing of every student in years three, five, seven, and nine. And, of course, some of the less able kids don't complete. And they have various mechanisms for that. My argument is that to get the item parameters... To get the item parameters, use the people who've completed all the questions because they're the ones that can respond to everything. If there's an interaction between uh, speed and ability and so on, then you've got people who might be rushing at the end and so on. So there's all sorts of reasons why those responses not, might not be uh, as valid as, the, as you want them to be. So we've shown it and reanalyzed and see that we could make an argument that if you use the responses of of people who completed everything, then that's the most valid set of estimates for the item parameters. After that, now you estimate a person's ability based on the items the person has done. And then it's a philosophical question or a operational question. If you If you only estimate the ability on the items they've done, then that might mean that you're ignoring that they could not do these other questions. So it becomes a, a, a separate question. Do you want to call uh, questions that have not been reached as wrong or you know, a score of zero, even if it's a polythemous question, or whether you want to just assess them on the questions they've done? And in fact, you can do both and, and make a comparison and then make some decisions. Uh, so it depends on uh, uh, so, so the question of incomplete data needs to be separated for the estimation of the item parameters, estimation of the person parameters. I would argue that for the item parameters, use the people who've responded to everything and then make a decision and comparison uh, about whether if a person has not answered a question, do we give it a zero because you assume that they are not good enough and therefore haven't completed because they they don't know their work and so on. So that really becomes a, uh, a kind of a policy question in the context. Yeah, I think, yep, thank you, Prof. That's why why we are using RAS, because it can predict missing data. So yeah. uh, when uh, we can predict missing data, so... Uh, so many things that that, uh, that can be calculated because the, as, as you mentioned the yeah. estimation is still going on they can they can result about the person ability okay the last question prof uh, is come from mr adio what are the main principle that differentiate between partial credit model and generalized partial credit models and what are the main principle that differentiate between partial credit model and generalized partial credit model, and rating scale model. Okay. Well, first of all, as I said before, rating scale and partial credit is simply that the threshold parameters in the partial credit might vary from item to item. But when a person responds to an item, the model is exactly the same. And in fact, in 1978 paper, I start with what people might call the rating scale model, and then I specialize it because it's just about a person responding to an item. And then it's a next question that I combine because to connect to the work that Rash had already, already written, connected to the case where you had a, a questionnaire with the same scale. The partial credit is just an alternative uh, setup where for some reason, like uh, assessments or even uh, questions, 
that the thresholds don't have to be the same from mm -hmm. item to item. The generalized partial credit model is not actually a rash model. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> it's, you've got different discriminations for the different items, and it's like the two-parameter model. So it's no longer a rash model. There's no sufficient statistics. Ah, oh, okay. It just right. has different so, discrimination. So, so it's 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 uh, it's it's like the two parameter model, but on on a polytomous item. So it's actually not not a rash model. Oh, okay, props. But I interestingly, think, uh... you're quite right. I might finish up. It is true that if you if you use more parameters, as mm -hmm. which is the disposition from a statistical perspective, the fit looks better and so on. But uh, I, some of that is artificial. As I said, with the you know, high discriminating item is a, is can be seen as a redundant item. Uh, so, uh, so if you pursue simply the statistics, you, think, you see this as a statistical problem that you solve by, by having extra parameters. If you take the rash paradigm, you say, I, I'm not getting measurements here, and I need to con uh, be concerned about my data collection, my items and how they're constructed and how people mark and so on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, sure. Very okay. Good. Thank you very much. I think we already got a very wonderful answer from you. So, because you are the one who invented the rating scale yeah. model. So, thank you very much uh, from David Hendrix so for very enlightening us about your own invention, that's I think Mr. Model. So it's, uh, we are very uh, grateful to have you here and then share your knowledge and expertise with us, okay? So right now, so I return back the screen to Buhani, right? As a MC, right? Go back, please, Buhani. Okay, thank you, Pak Bambang Sumintono. Ladies and gentlemen, we finally come to the end of our meeting today. Great appreciation delivered to our distinguished speaker and moderator for very interesting presentation and dynamic discussion. For closing remarks, ladies and gentlemen, kindly invited the honor Ibu Asrianti PhD, Head of Center for Educational Assessment. Ibu Yanti, microphone is yours. Thank you, Bu Heni, uh, Pak Bambang, David, thank you very much. Uh, it's always inspiring as always and then i think it's uh this give me more motivation to study more and more some i already forget david sorry <laughs> okay uh again thank you very much i hope this uh lecture will uh, provide insight for all especially may maybe some of us use this ras model uh very extensively but maybe we don't really appreciate the feature and the requirements. So in order to get a better measurement, I think we need to look at back and then uh, look at carefully and then uh, what it is supposed to do. Again, thank you very much, David. Uh, I hope we can have a, another lecture maybe next year. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ibu Yanti. A okay, bit and Thank general. you very much. And, uh, I, I enjoy interacting and uh, seeing Yanti again, or even if it's on the screen. And uh, uh, it makes me think about this topic again. And I, as I say, I've been thinking about it for many, many years. So if you find some of these things a little bit challenging or difficult, that's okay. It's supposed to be. It's supposed to keep you very alert. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, okay. Professor David. Yeah. And I'll send you a couple of papers, uh, Yanti, and then you can pass them on. Okay, sure. Thank you, David. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Annie. Bye. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much again for all participants. Looking forward to see you again in our next, our other public lecture. May God always bless us. Have a wonderful day. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Thank you. Oke, okay, makasih Bu Heni, Bu Yanti. Makasih. Log off. Thank you. Bye bye.
Pusat Asesmen Pendidikan atau Pusmendik adalah unit kerja di bawah Badan Standar Kurikulum dan Asesmen Pendidikan, Kementerian Pendidikan, Kebudayaan, Riset, dan Teknologi. Pusat Asesmen Pendidikan mempunyai tugas melaksanakan penyiapan kebijakan teknis dan pelaksanaan asesmen pendidikan. Pusat Asesmen Pendidikan telah beberapa kali mengalami perubahan nomenklatur dari Puslit Bang Sistian, Puspendi, Pusmenjar, dan Pusmendi. Perubahan nomenklatur ini tentunya membuat Pusmendik harus selalu responsif dengan paradigma dunia pendidikan. Pusat Asesmen Pendidikan telah memperoleh predikat WBK pada tahun 2019. Pencapaian ini tidak lepas dari inovasi yang terus dilakukan oleh Pusmendik. Pusmendik telah melakukan lompatan besar dalam evaluasi pendidikan, di antaranya mengubah moda ujian nasional dari ujian nasional berbasis kertas dan pensil menjadi ujian nasional berbasis komputer. Seiring dengan berubahnya tuntutan kemampuan peserta didik dalam menghadapi tantangan global dan hakikat pendidikan sebagai sarana untuk mengembangkan kompetensi dan karakter peserta didik, Bus Mendik mengembangkan evaluasi pendidikan yang lebih komprehensif dalam memotret kualitas pendidikan di Indonesia melalui asesmen nasional atau AM. Asesmen nasional tidak bertujuan untuk menilai atau memeringkatkan individu atau sekolah. Asesmen nasional memotret input, proses, dan output pembelajaran sehingga dapat digunakan untuk memperbaiki kualitas pembelajaran. Asesmen nasional dilaksanakan dengan menggunakan tiga instrumen, yaitu AKM, Survei Karakter, dan Survei Lingkungan Belajar. Hasil asesmen nasional dilaporkan dalam bentuk rapor pendidikan yang dapat digunakan oleh pemangku kepentingan untuk melakukan perbaikan. Pusmendik telah sukses melaksanakan asesmen nasional untuk pertama kali pada tahun 2021. Keberhasilan Pusmendik ini merupakan capaian luar biasa yang melibatkan seluruh elemen di Pusmendik. Berbagai inovasi dilakukan untuk mendukung pelaksanaan asesmen nasional di antaranya Pengembangan aplikasi pendataan, ayo coba AKM, pengembangan aplikasi penulisan soal atau siap, dan sistem delivery pelaksanaannya yaitu ANDK. Aplikasi pendataan untuk memudahkan pendataan satuan pendidikan, siswa, guru, dan kepala sekolah. Ayo coba AKM, membantu siswa dalam memahami bentuk-bentuk soal dalam asesmen nasional yang bervariasi. Pengembangan aplikasi penulisan soal atau SIAP mendukung penyiapan instrumen dalam asesmen nasional dengan keterjangkauan penulis soal yang lebih luas sehingga dapat menghasilkan instrumen yang berkualitas. Pengembangan sistem delivery berbasis komputer dengan moda daring dan semi daring memungkinkan seluruh sekolah dapat melaksanakan asesmen nasional berbasis komputer menyesuaikan sarana dan prasarana yang dimiliki. Pusmendi juga mengembangkan inovasi dalam bidang evaluasi, di antaranya asesmen pedia. Asesmen pedia dikembangkan untuk mendukung pelaksanaan program Merdeka Mengajar. Asesmen pedia merupakan platform aplikasi berbasis web yang dikembangkan untuk memfasilitasi guru di seluruh Indonesia untuk saling berbagi dan berkontribusi dalam penyusunan instrumen yang berkualitas. Asesmen pedia memungkinkan guru-guru mata pelajaran berkolaborasi menyusun instrumen. AKM Kelas AKM Kelas dikembangkan untuk membantu guru melaksanakan asesmen diagnostik kemampuan literasi dan numerasi peserta didik berbasis aplikasi. Melalui AKM Kelas, guru dapat mengetahui tingkat literasi dan numerasi peserta didik secara individu. Hasil diagnosa tersebut dapat dimanfaatkan oleh guru untuk merancang pembelajaran sesuai dengan tingkat kompetensi peserta didik atau teaching at the right level. Pusmendik menyediakan paket-paket soal literasi dan numerasi yang dapat digunakan oleh guru secara gratis. Kini, AKM Kelas telah tersedia dan dapat diunduh dalam versi desktop atau Windows dan mobile atau Android. Desa Tika, membangun desa dengan matematika. Desa Tika dikembangkan sebagai model assessment as learning melalui permainan matematika. 
Selain mengembangkan berbagai inovasi untuk mendukung pendidik melakukan asesmen, Pusmendik juga memberikan pelayanan kepada beberapa lembaga atau kementerian untuk keperluan seleksi, di antaranya CPNS, PPPK, Taruna Polri, Taruna Akmil, LPDP, dosen dan mahasiswa kampus mengajar, serta beasiswa Indonesia Maju. Pusmendik berkomitmen untuk selalu melakukan inovasi dalam rangka membentuk masyarakat cerdas melalui asesmen yang berkualitas. Just 